And we'll turn our attention to God's Word. We're going to go to the epistle lesson that's appointed for this day, which is found in Romans, the 13th chapter, and we pick up reading at the first verse. And Paul writes to us in the church of all time, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. We're going to be starting a sermon series today. We'll be going over it for the next several weeks. We're going to be dealing with what's a buzzword in our culture, and it's a buzzword in the church of Jesus Christ, and that's the word authentic. Those outside the church are looking at those of us inside the church and questioning our authenticity. Are we real? Are we genuine? And we are being accused, and probably quite honestly so, that we preach a good game, we teach a good game, we talk a good game, but we don't necessarily practice what we preach. And the outside world sees this hypocrisy and they're turned off by it. They want genuine, real people. They want to know that we're struggling to obey God just as much as they are. We're struggling against sin just as hard as they are. And we have failed in that periodically, and we have succeeded in it when God has blessed us and strengthened us. They want to see real, genuine people, not people who pretend to be something they're not. And that is interfering with our ability to share the gospel with those outside the church. But it's also a buzzword inside the church because it's affecting how we relate to one another. If we are hypocritical within the church, if, if we never get to know the real you or the real me, if there's just all this pretending going on, then we never really go deeper as the body of Christ and we will never realize what God is calling the body to be. So we'll be wrestling with this over the next several weeks. What does it mean to be authentic? How would you become authentic? What would authentic outreach look like? And, and what would we do differently in the church as the family of God if we were really wanting to be real and genuine as the Bible would describe it? And so to get your minds thinking about this, I've got a little video that I want you to watch and it'll hopefully prime the pump for me. Social media is great. It connects you to the world and the people you love. You can chat with your family or share a meal with friends and watch cute little cats do unbelievable things. Look, she sticks her head out of the box. Look, she sticks her head out of the box. But there are times when social media can get in the way of the real world. Remember that? It's the thing that happens when you run out of battery. That's why we've developed the Social Media Guard. It takes the social out of media and puts it back into your life. Let's see how it works.
social media guard. Get yours now. They're on sale in the atrium after worship. Uh, no, not really. No, no. I'm not here to go on to a you know little diatribe against social media. I'm not. I'm not here to tell you you know get off your smartphones or you know get off of Facebook or whatever. They can all be gifts of God and they can be used to His glory. Uh, I'm, I you know I joked before. I'm, I'm I'm trying myself to learn more and more and more about how we can use technology and use it to, for the advancement of the kingdom. I realized about 10 years ago how out of step I was with contemporary society. My my daughter was engaged to be married to her husband now, but uh, he's in the Marine Corps and he was serving over in Kuwait. And so she moved uh, home with us when she graduated from college so she could save some money uh, so when they got married, you know, they'd have a little bit more money. She's a school teacher, so she was up in her room. She was grading papers. And whenever Amanda likes to grade papers, she plays a lot of loud music. So there's a lot of loud music coming downstairs from her room, and she's grading papers. And Lynn was in the kitchen, and she had gotten dinner all ready, and now it was time to call everybody to the table. And my wife picked up her phone, and she texted my daughter upstairs, dinner is ready. <laughs> Not my world. How many of us can remember when dinner was ready, and you were upstairs and went more like this? Mom went to the bottom of the stairs and said, dinner's ready. Anybody remember those days? I remember. You know, nobody texts you at home. You know. I watch people now in McDonald's uh, sitting across from each other having a conversation on the phone with one another. It's like, look up. You know, there you are. But I'm not here to really blast the technology. I think, it, again, it's a gift of God. I'm not here to tell you to put your phone down. I am here to suggest pick your Bible up. I'm here to suggest that if we want biblical, authentic Christian community, that the only way we're going to get there is Jesus Christ and the Word of God. So let's define our terms. If we're going to be talking about authentic over the next several weeks, let's define it. Webster says it means to be real or genuine, not copied or false. It's true. It's accurate. Uh, it's made to look like the original. Now, when you think of the original human being, I think you're going to go back to Adam and Eve. Let me suggest, no, they failed. Let me suggest the original we want to go back to is the only perfect man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so if we want to be authentic, if we want to be real, we want to be genuine, we want to be like Jesus. And we want to love like Jesus and care like Jesus, and we want a community that reflects Jesus. And it's only when we become that community that really reflects and looks like the original that our outreach to the world will have greater impact. But there's a biblical understanding and a biblical definition uh, of this that's different than Webster's because the original Greek word authentes really referred to suicide. Somebody who was authentes had killed themselves. And as the culture used that word and it grew in its understanding and its uh, application, it more and more and more uh, came to refer to, if you will, killing parts of your life. Uh, cutting off some parts of your life, stopping some habits. And so to become authentic meant that you recognized there were deadly things in your life that you needed to get rid of, and in a sense, you killed them. You got rid of them. You quit doing those things because they were deadly to you, to your marriage, to your family, to other relationships. Jesus talks about that. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now, obviously, he's also talking about death there. We need to be willing to die for Jesus. <clears throat> there are people all over the Middle East that are dying for Jesus right now. But there's also the sense of dying to certain parts of my life, dying to the sin in my life, dying to those sinful desires in my life, dying to those sinful habits in my life. <clears throat> and the more I die to sin, the more I discover life as God has always wanted it to be. So to be authentic from a biblical perspective is to lose all that's fake, all that's pretend, and learn to live like him, learn to live the life that Jesus always intended for us. When we begin to do that, our life together will get deeper and deeper and deeper. And our ability to bring others to Jesus Christ will become greater and greater and greater. 
So we're going to explore four areas of life that Chris Hodges identified in uh, one of his books, and he's put it out there. You can Google it. You can find it in a lot of different blogs now. It's kind of everywhere. He talked about these four areas of life. There's the arena. That's the area of life. That's kind of the surface. Talk about that in a second. But that means, you know, there's things that I know about me, and you know them about me. And there's things that I know about you, and you know them about you. There's just kind of that surface relationship. And if we go a little deeper, then there's those things that I know about me, but you don't know about me, and I don't want you to know that about me, because I'm afraid our relationship would change if you found out those things about me. So I put on a mask. I hide. I don't let you know that that's a part of my life. I pretend to be somebody I'm really not. Then there are blind spots, he said, in our life. That means I don't know, but you do. There are some sinful realities in my life that need to change if I'm going to become what God wants me to become, if I want to do what God wants me to do. But I don't see them, maybe because I don't want to. Maybe I'm just in denial. I don't want to deal with it. I'm too ashamed. I'm too embarrassed. And so I've just put it down so long. I don't even see it anymore. I've just accepted it. I just see it as normal. But you see it as sin. Can you love me enough to humbly come alongside me and confront me? And then he said there's potential. There's that part of life that could be that only God knows about. Great things that God would do in your life. Great moments of reconciliation, forgiveness that God might work in your marriage or your family. Great moments that God might want to work through St. Paul, Luther, and church. Great, incredible, miraculous things, but they aren't happening. They aren't happening because we're not authentic. We're not real. We don't really think he'll do this. We don't really believe that God could or would do these things in our marriage, our home, our church, or whatever. And we'll be talking about these four areas of life and how we become more authentic and the blessings that will come into our life as we become more authentic over the next several weeks. So let's back up and let's go to the arena. And that's the part of life where I know and you know. That's that surface area of life. There are certain things that you know about me if you come to worship and listen to me week after week after week. Some easy things. You know I'm a Cub fan. And if we're going to confront blind spots, uh, you're, some of you are White Sox fans, you're just wrong. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Some of us are Bear fans. I know that God has allowed some Packer fans into our congregation. So we have little boxes that we check off. He roots for this team. He roots for that team. If you listen to my sermons, you read my stuff I put on Facebook, you know that politically I'm conservative. I wouldn't claim to be a Republican because I'm not so sure the Republicans are conservative anymore, but I'm conservative. Now, I realize if I say you're on the other end of the spectrum, I would call you a liberal. I realize you don't want to be called that now. We'll call you progressives. And, and so some of you are progressive and some of us are conservative. We begin to put labels on one another. This is the 11 o'clock crowd. This is the crowd that realizes that ancient practice of stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight that we do at 8 o'clock. Just, you know, it's meaningless, doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, it's just rote. Pastor says, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Every good Lutheran knows the phrase. See, we can say this stuff, we can recite it, and we can go through it and not mean any of it. So you say, I'm a real lover of Jesus, and I want real, genuine worship of Jesus. I'm going to go to 11 o'clock. That's where the real worship of Jesus goes. And so we have the 8 o'clock, and we have the 11 o'clock crowd, and now we have a 9.30 crowd that is in Spanish. And we begin to put people into boxes and into labels and different categories. And here's what happens at the surface. See, what if your boxes and my boxes don't match? And what if enough of them don't match? It doesn't mean you don't love me because you love me because you follow Jesus. But you don't want me over at your house because I'm a conservative and you're not, because I'm an 8 o'clocker and you're an 11 o'clocker, because I'm a Cub fan and you're a Sox fan, or, you know, whatever it is, pick a category. We start going, eh, nice guy, you know, but I don't really ever really want to get to know him. We just don't have anything in common. And even at the surface level, we begin to cut off relationships for stuff that doesn't matter. 
for opinions and desires and passions that in the big scheme of the kingdom of God are meaningless. That when we get to heaven, nobody's going to care who you voted for. Nobody's going to care who you rooted for. Nobody's going to care what your fiscal policies were. But now we allow these surface issues to break us up. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. He loved Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and didn't agree with any of them. But he loved them. He was gracious. He was inclusive. He brought them into the kingdom of God. He loved Jews and Gentiles. And he was gracious and merciful to all of them. And he invited all of them into the kingdom of God. All these little boxes that they were checking off in his day, time, and culture. Jesus said, no, nah, that's nonsense. Let's get past that. Let's open our hearts. Let's open our lives. And let's bring them in. And let's love them. If we can't start at this surface level, we can't ever go deeper. If we can't learn to love people who disagree with us, who have different priorities, who see reality different than we do, we'll never be able to go deeper into the more meaningful parts of the kingdom life. But as we go deeper, then we get into that mask area of life where I don't want you to know. You see, I know what's going on in my life, but I don't want you to know. There are some things in my past that I'm ashamed of, I'm embarrassed by, and I'm terrified that you'll find out. There are some things that I've done or experienced or happened to me that have changed me and shaped me, but I don't want you to know because I'm afraid if you know, you won't like me. If you know the real me, you'll be shocked, you'll be put off, and our relationship might come to an end. And so since I don't want you to know, I put on a mask, and I pretend to be someone who doesn't have that past, who didn't do those things, who didn't experience those realities. We can never get deeper if we all wear masks. If the only me you know is the me I want you to know, You'll never really know me. And you can't love me. You'll love the pretend me. So, how do we do this? And Jesus said, you can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip and your true face will be known. And you know, I think when the crowds heard that that day, that was terrifying. Whoa, wait a minute. Is he going to expose us? Is he going to tell everybody what's happened? Are they all going to know? And, and, and it's frightening that somebody might find out about the real me. It's also liberating. And it's also healing. It's exhausting to pretend to be something I'm not. I have to remember all the lies I've told you. I have to remember all the things I've covered up. And I have to be always anxious, always afraid that my mask is going to slip and you're going to see the real broken and scarred Danny. Wouldn't it be awesome if I could just take it off? and you not be shocked and not run away and not leave me but love me for who I really am and we have to understand that is not going to happen here on Sunday morning I'm not going to walk up to you right now and say please stand up and tell us your most deepest darkest secrets I'm not really going to do that at all I wouldn't do that to anybody and I wouldn't do it myself. We don't all know each other. We don't all trust each other. We don't have a relationship with everybody in this room. You don't feel safe in this kind of a, a crowd. You need a smaller, more intimate environment where you build relationships, where you build that kind of trust, where you build that kind of safety, and you know that when you take that mask off, they're not going to be shocked. They're going to love you. Because when you take that mask off, you know who they're going to see? They're going to see themselves. Because when you take your mask off, I see a broken, flawed, struggling sinner. And when you take your mask off, I see me. Because that's me too. And it's not an accident 
that we're having this sermon series on authenticity now in September. You know, it wasn't like, hmm, what should I talk about in September? How can I get some crowds? No. Craig, stand up for a second real quick. Okay, that was enough. Sit down. <laughs> Craig is the director of group life at St. Paul. If you don't know him, get to know him. He's a great guy. He's been working with over 20, 25 people, getting them ready to launch small group ministries in October. I'm telling you now, when they launch, get in one. I'm asking you now, when they launch, get in one. Get into a group, get to know people, build that sense of safety, build that sense of security with a small group of intimate people, brothers and sisters in Christ, gathered around the scriptures, gathered around the gospel story of Jesus, where you can be known and you can be loved, and you can take your mask off. You're not going to do it in the big public setting. So we will create a smaller, more intimate setting where you can build that sense of safety and get it done. And I know, and I'll talk about at the end of the sermon, right now, having said that, that we're going to be launching these, and I want you to, to sign up, and I want you to be in one. Most of you are now coming up with all the reasons why you can't. Your schedule is too busy. Your life's too full. There's too many things going on. You're already too busy. To this, to that, to this, to that. Stop it. What's more important than growing deeper as the family of God? This is your family. You are here because God brought you here. You're not here by accident. You didn't choose this. God called you here to be a part of this Christian family. And we want to love you and we want to be loved by you. We want to care for you and we want you to care for us. We don't want to go deeper without you. We want to go deeper with you. And so I need you to be praying about when those groups launch, you get in one, and we get deeper and deeper and deeper. We've got blind spots in our life. Those are the things I don't know, but you do. Uh, you look at me all the time, and you go, Danny, you got some problems. And you know, I, I, I do, but I don't know them all. Notice that Jesus uh, called the spiritual leaders in his day and time blind guides. They were really good at going, you got problems. You know, you people need to stop it. They were great at standing up in the sermon opportunity thinking, you know, you really need to repent. You know, God knows what you're doing. You better stop that. They were good at pointing out everybody else's flaws, but their own. And people outside the church are saying the same thing about us. You're really good at condemning us. You're really good at telling us what we do wrong. You're really good at telling us how we don't follow the Bible. You're great at quoting a chapter and verse to us. Why don't you do this? You're defying the Word of God. You're not doing the will of God. Do you ever look at yourselves? Do you ever look in the mirror? Do you think maybe you've got some struggles? Are we blind guides? Afraid to look at ourselves? Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults, the psalmist said. Lord, I know there's all kinds of realities in my life that I don't want to deal with, that I don't even see, that I've just learned to accept. I know they're there. Help me to see them. Forgive me. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Turning a sinner from the error of his ways. There are some biblical realities we need to relearn. Correction rebuke, accountability. The Bible says we are to correct one another. You're supposed to love me enough to come alongside me and say, Danny, uh, I saw this in your life. I think you need to work on that. Can I pray with you? Can I work with you? Can we get into the Bible together? Uh, you come alongside me humbly, not with pride or arrogance or conceit, not that you're better than me, but as a broken brother, you go, hey, I'm struggling over here, but I see that you're struggling here. Can I help you with your struggle? Can we love each other enough to do that? That's not going to happen here in this room. That's not going to happen on a Sunday morning. That's why you got to get into a smaller, more intimate environment. That's why when we launch these small groups, you need to be in one. So somebody can love you enough to say, you know, there are some areas in your life where God is asking you to grow. And we'd all like to pray for you. And we'd all like to uh, help you. And we'd like to hold you accountable. Accountability has become a dirty word in the church. But God has a complete understanding of it. There should be mutual ministry here. 
each of us helping each of us to grow but you're not going to help hundreds of people to grow so get into a small group help five people to grow and have five people help you to grow somebody else can see it will you let somebody else love you enough to help you deal with it will you love someone else enough to step in and help them deal with it well, finally, there's potential. I've asked everybody in, in, in all the other services, I'll ask you, what if God came to you tonight and said, I need you to go to Papua New Guinea and I, and I want you to do mission work there. Uh, plane leaves uh, Tuesday at noon. Pack a bag and get on it. Would you go? I'm going to guess almost everybody in this room said no. Why not? I'm going to guess most of us in this room said, I, I don't know the first thing about doing mission work. I don't have any education. I don't have any training. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'd be lost. I'm going to get off a plane in a foreign country and just go, hey, Jesus man is here. Let's go. You, know, you wouldn't know what to do. Abraham didn't know what to do. God said, hey, leave your family, go to a land, and when you get there, I'll tell you you're there. So just get on the road, boy, and when I tell you to stop, you stop. And he did. Moses said, hey, I can't go speak to Pharaoh. I, I, I had speech problems. I, I failed speech twice in high school. I didn't do real well. I, I, I stutter, I stammer, and I, I, I'm not real confident. I have no charisma. You need somebody else. He came up with all these reasons. And God said, no, no, you're my man. You're my man. Go. And he did. Think of those uh, 12 disciples that Jesus picked. Really? Losers, right? I mean, come on. You would not have picked those people. There was not a single uh, charismatic guy. Nobody had run a multi-million or billion dollar business. Uh, nobody had people that followed them. They didn't have personalities that, you know, people said, wow, that's a great guy. Let's go learn from him. They were simple, ordinary people. God chooses and then God uses whom he will. Why is it then when you're out there, you seize your potential. You seize it in your career. And you work and you work and you slave and you slave and you sacrifice and you sacrifice and you grow and you grow and you try to move in advance and get ahead in your career because you think you can do it. Why out there do you see potential? Why on the athletic field do you work so hard, bust your butt in practice after practice after practice because you think you could be good, you think you could be a starter and you've got that potential in you and you work so hard to make it happen. You practice and you practice and you practice scale after scale after scale after scale. Because you think there's a musician hidden in you and you want to unleash them. Why do you see potential in so many other areas of your life until you get to church? And when you get in here, you get depressed, you get down, you get so insecure. You're no good. There's nothing God could do for you. You're worthless. Uh, God needs to use somebody else. After all, that's why we hire staff. God wants to use you. God wants to do great things, not just in the ministry, not just in numbers. God wants to do great things in your heart. God wants to do miraculous things in your marriage. He wants to bring about healing and forgiveness and reconciliation and newness. God wants to heal you and your parents, you and your siblings, you and that longtime friend. God wants to do things that you think can't be done anymore. It's way too late. Too many things have gone on. Jesus said to us, you will do greater things than I did. You will do greater things than Jesus. That's his promise. The issue is, we don't believe that. And so it don't happen. We don't believe God will bring thousands of people to St. Paul and have those people come to know Jesus Christ. We don't really believe that, so we don't do anything to help him make that happen. We bought a building. And we're still paralyzed because we're not really sure that God can do great things through us. Are you kidding? No, there's other churches. Hey, now you go over there. There's a great. Oh, 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 yeah. What about us? God knows the plans he has for us, but we have to be open to them. To be authentic, to be real, to be genuine is to say, God, I don't know the first thing about mission work. But if you're calling me, I'll get on that plane. 
I don't know the first thing about this or that, God. But if you're calling me, then you'll use me and I'll go. We're going to launch these small groups, these small settings for us to become real, us to become genuine, us to become original, us to become authentic. And I know most of you already are saying no. Let us love you. Give us a chance. We need I'm saying yes, and let me know. All right, th thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> Write his name down. <laughs> All right. Okay. We need you to love us. I need you to love me. You need me to love you. Where's that going to happen? When's that going to happen? When is this body of Christ going to become the real body of Christ God knows we can be? When are we going to do the things that God knows we can do? Each of us needs to grow. But we need to grow together. And we need to go together. But we'll have issues and friction and problems and conflict and all that stuff as we struggle to set the boxes aside and get beyond the surface issues, take the masks off and say, you know what, here I am come alongside each other and go, you know what, there's really something you need to work on. I know. I've been struggling myself. Let me help you. <clears throat> to wake up one day as the body of Christ here and go, wow, look at the great things God is doing. Six months ago, I wasn't sure that would ever happen. But I gave him my heart. I gave him my life. I gave him a chance. And wow. Look what he did. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, off to a good start. But it's just a start. We have a long way to go and a lifetime to overcome. But the God who works with us is greater than anything that's in our past. And the God who is with us is greater than anything that comes against us. And the God who is with us is greater than anything that lies in our way. We pray that we would become a lot more like the original, a lot more like your son, and love one another as he has so desperately, so deeply, so powerfully loved us. All to the glory of your name and for the explosion of your kingdom in this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise.